Thank you very, very much. Uh, my name is Greg McDonald. Uh, I'm with the Agronomy Department uh, in the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants uh, at the University of Florida, and I'm part of the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Today, what I'm going to talk about is Kogan grass, which is a highly invasive species that's for, found throughout Alachua County. It's found throughout uh, the southeastern United States. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about its biology, its impacts that it causes, and a little bit about how we uh, have used research to try to best tackle uh, in controlling this, uh, this problematic species. So let me first give you a little biology about this grass. Um, this grass is native to the Southeast Asia uh, area, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, all throughout that region, Kogan grass. Uh, has been spread and, and is uh, actually a problem in those areas as well. Um, worldwide, it infests almost 500 million acres. It's on every single continent with the exception of Ant Antarctica. And it really uh, is most problematic in tropical areas, uh, monsoonal rainfall pattern areas, but it can extend up into temperate regions. How it came to the United States was through two different methods or two different introductions. The first one was accidental uh, through a packing crate filled with Satsuma oranges. They used the grass to pack around the oranges and uh, that introduction came from Japan in uh, Alabama 1911. And then it was uh, intentionally introduced by the USDA as a potential forage. Uh, and this was an a introduction from the Philippines. It was established in Mississippi. Uh, a part of that population was then brought to Florida in that Brooksville area. It was also established in Gainesville. Uh, unfortunately found out it really wasn't a very good forage, but by then it had escaped and uh, started to infest a lot of different areas throughout Florida. So um, we tried to look at it as a forage. Uh, like I said, in central Florida, there was a lot planted in the Ocala area. There was a lot planted in Polk County. Um, and in North Florida, but when Bahia grass and Bermuda grass and other desirable forages came into play, Kogan grass was quickly displaced. It really has poor nutritional quality, particularly once the uh, leaves get to more than um, 12 inches in height. It begins to accumulate silicates and the nitrogen or protein content really begins to drop in the species. So it really isn't a good forage. Uh, cows will graze it, uh, but they would prefer something else. Okay, in Florida, uh, it's distributed pretty much uh, throughout the state. It doesn't occur as prevalently in South Florida, um, but we do see a lot of areas in that Central Florida area, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, Polk County, uh, all the way up through um, Sumter County into Alachua, or, um, Marion counties as well, and it's quite prevalent in the, in the Panhandle. It is most likely to be found in uh, pineland forests, rights of way, um, mining areas, and also abandoned areas as well. It's beginning to show uh, uh, problems in some of our rangeland areas in the central part of the state. It is very highly adaptable to poor soils, uh, droughty conditions, and pyrogenic or fire-based e ecosystems. And if we look at a lot of what um, the ecosystems that have uh, that occur in Florida, a lot of those are pretty much matched up with how Kogan does very well. If we look at a distribution map of, of, of it, we can see that it is highly clustered in that central Florida area. Not so much once we get down into that Miami-Dade section, uh, but throughout the center part of the state and it, throughout the panhandle, it is, it is quite prevalent. And uh, more than likely, we're probably looking at totally amount of uh, areas that have some level of infestation would be 750 to a million acres, 750,000 to a million acres. Now, uh, from an impact standpoint, uh, it is considered to be a category one invasive species by the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, which is a organization that works on invasive species um, throughout the state of Florida. It is considered to be a federal and also a state noxious weed, uh, according to the state and federal governments. It is a very strong competitor. Uh, it out displaces most native species. It forms these large monotypic or 
basically solid coking grass stands. It will alter the ecosystem. It increases uh, fire uh, frequency. Also in areas that are normally fire tolerant because of the, the total amount of biomass that kogan grass produces, the fire intensity is much more and you will actually kill uh, fire adapted species due to this uh, very hot and intense fires. It is becoming a problem in the rangeland, uh, the Osceola County areas. I've done quite a bit of work down there uh, and it is a problem where it's invading uh, rangelands and uh, it is allelopathic, which means it exudes compounds from its roots and from its leaves that deter the growth of other plants around it. So it has a very wide adaptation mechanism uh, for maintaining itself, i.e. Kogan grass, as the dominant species within an area. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some steps in how we identify it. There are lots of publications. The Center for Aquatic Invasive Plants with the University of Florida has lots of publications. There are also uh, many venues on the web that talk about how to um, uh, identify and also how, how to control. But I'm going to go through a couple of quick slides here that talk a little bit about how it looks and then we'll get into um, some control measures that we've looked at for trying to manage this species. So the, the mature plant itself, uh, what is above ground is almost all leaves. It doesn't put any stems above ground. It's the leaves arise directly from these below ground stems called rhizomes. They can be either two to six feet tall, uh, depending on the amount of water, depending on the, uh, the soil type that is growing it. Like I said, it produces an extensive amount of rhizomes, which are below ground stems. It also is fairly successful in low light environments. So it likes to, to kind of get itself established underneath the, the fringe or shady edges of hardwood hammocks. It does very well in uh, pine stands. Uh, it maintains pretty good cover underneath those. And like I said, it, it forms these very large expansive monocultures. The leaf blades um, are anywhere from a half to three quarters of an inch wide and the, the leaves come right from the base. So as I mentioned before, if you go out there and you see stems above ground, it is likely not kogan grass. Yeah, the midrib is often kind of whitish in color, but it's always offset. So it's not right in the center of the leaf, it's, it's offset to one side and the other very key identifying characteristic that if you run your hand backwards down the leaves, you'll feel these very sharp edges on either side where it, it accumulates silica and that's to deter animals and other um, things from either walking through it or grazing on it. So uh, once those leaves begin to get anywhere from 8 to 12 inches, you will, you will begin to feel that, that silica content uh, increase in the leaves. These leaves, um, as I mentioned, uh, are formed from rhizomes. And the other thing that kogan grass does compared to a lot of other native grasses is it will put an enormous amount of energy and photosynthates down to building the rhizome base. And these rhizomes are extensive and in some estimates can be upwards of 40 tons of total rhizome biomass per acre. And it's the rhizome biomass that makes it difficult to manage because over two thirds of the plant is actually below ground. The panicle or the seed head of kogan grass is also very distinctive. It is this white fluffy uh, flower stalk that is the only stem you will actually see, see above ground. It generally flowers in the spring uh, but it will also flower in response to a drought period. So um, in this, the past couple of weeks, we've had kind of a dry spell here in central Florida. And most of the time, that will trigger a flowering response in kogan grass, particularly our larger established stands. The seed head is, is anywhere from three to six inches long. It's that fluffy white seeds that are attached with many, many hairs. And this plume of hairs allows the kogan grass to be taken up by wind and blown uh, quite a large distance, um, allowing it to spread. Fortunately for us, most kogan grass that we see does not produce viable seeds. 
uh, and therefore the spread by seeds is very minimal. However, in the last few years, we have seen a lot more potential seed increase, which makes uh, management uh, a little bit more difficult um, when we're dealing with not only rhizomes, but also seeds. Now, when uh, I begin this section here on management, I'm going to talk about an integrated approach. So we use five different methods, or there are five different methods available or defined for controlling any species uh, that's considered a weed. And a lot of this I teach in my classes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the five different things that we try to integrate or utilize to control Kogan grass. Now preventative is one of those ones that uh, it's easy to talk about, it's not as easy to practice, but basically what we're trying to do is we remove existing areas that have patches that have Kogan grass, um, and that includes getting the rhizomes out. And now the rhizomes are generally in that top six to eight inches, but there can be some that will go down two, two to three feet. So we try to remove everything and then get uh, another plant or desirable species back, back in there. We also try to uh, prevent the movement of plant material. So in a lot of road building, a lot of ditch bank, uh, fire cutting fire lanes and pines, any other type of disturbance where you're actually uh, cutting in and moving rhizomes around, fill dirt, things like that. Uh, those are things that we try to avoid if we can um, to uh, not allow those rhizomes to spread around. And also what we're doing here today, and, and that is providing uh, educational materials to uh, inform the public about the uh, problems associated with Kogan grass and also what to do about it uh, if, if we do have it. Cultural. Uh, cultural is one of those techniques that we basically try to use um, other plants and other um, agronomic quote ag agronomic techniques to promote the um, the growth of a native or desirable species to deter or eliminate um, the undesirable in this case Kogan grass so one of the things that we want to do is once we um, get Kogan grass out is put some desirable species in either allow nature to occur uh, natural recruitment or we try to actually go in and do restoration uh, another thing is try to minimize disturbance. Kogan grass is one of those species that really likes to move into an open area that's been disturbed. So we try to minimize that. Um, and also be wary of the fact that Kogan grass, even at very low infestation levels, is a very strong competitor. And trying to put other plants in to compete, it hasn't been that successful. Uh, in a lot of the uh, management strategies that we've employed. So the best way here, if you got it, make sure it's completely gone, then put something else in. Or if it's next to where you have a good established stand, keep that established stand happy and it will deter the Kogan grass as best it can. From a biological standpoint, here is where we try to use a natural enemy, either an insect or a fungus. Um, to try to attack only Kogan grass, be very specific. Unfortunately, we've had very limited success. We've done a lot of uh, travels to its native range, uh, Southeast Asia, and even in the native range, we found very few insects and pathogens that cause an extensive amount of damage to warrant uh, trying to utilize that as a biocontrol. So unfortunately, we haven't made a lot of progress uh, in this area, but uh, at some point, uh, maybe there is um, something out there that, that prefers Kogan to, uh, to eat, so to speak. Mechanical. Uh, mechanical control actually works very well. If you have an open field or an open area that is solid Kogan grass, um, extensive disking or soil disturbance will eventually eliminate the grass uh, depending on drought conditions and how aggressive and frequent the tillage is. Um, it will work to deter Kogan and that's why we don't see Kogan grass in um, cultivated fields that we're planting on an annual basis. We don't see Kogan grass. Uh, so it, it does do a very good job. The key here is 
frequency. Try to do it during the dry season and also um, make sure that if you're bringing uh, any type of heavy equipment that it is a very aggressive heavy equipment that it reaches down at least 12 inches to try to bring those rhizomes up um, up there. It is very effective uh, integrated with, with burning uh, to try to reduce that above ground thatch allowing the mechanical uh, control treatments to work a little better. So um, the other thing is if you're going to employ a mechanical technique, make sure that you're continuous with it. A one-time cultivation really doesn't do you any good and will actually be cause more issues with Kogan grass because it cuts the rhizomes up and causes more shoots to come back. We talk a little bit about burning. and Burning is a form of mechanical control. Um, it does a really good job at removing the leaves, but once again, like I said, if, it's, if there are other plant species around that are desirable, uh, you will more than likely see damage, if not death, to those desirable species, including very, fairly large trees. Um, you will see an enhancement of either mechanical or chemical control because of the fact you're removing a lot of the dead leaves that often occur intermingled with the live leaves. But uh, as far as a control measure by itself, uh, it will provide absolutely no control. As a matter of fact, I've seen Kogan grass within a week after a burn is almost eight inches tall. So it responds very quickly. It is adapted to a fire-based ecosystem. If we talk now a little bit about our last management technique, and this is probably the most employed management technique, and that is chemical control. And uh, in this case, we can either do very large broadcast applications for larger areas, uh, glyphosate or imazepir. Uh, at the labeled rates for glyphosate, we want to use the maximum labeled rate uh, that's, that occurs on the label of the um, chemical. Uh, for imazepir, we want to use those labeled rates used for perennial grass control. And we can also do spot treatments, and this is where you're using a, uh, a smaller backpack type of uh, application device. It, here, once again, you want to look at the label of the uh, either chemical, either herbicide to put it out at the appropriate rates uh, that, that occur on there. Also, uh, you want to uh, use a surfactant, which is a uh, sticker. Uh, adjuvant that provides a little bit better uptake of the herbicide once it gets on, on the leaves uh, at the label recommendations. One of the things that I will point out is both glyphosate and imazepir are what we call non-selective herbicides. So that means any plant that comes in contact with the spray of these herbicides is or will be controlled along with the Kogan grass. Um, so if you have uh, a desirable species mixed in with Kogan grass and you spray over the top, you will kill both of those, both the Kogan and the desirable species. The other thing that I'll mention is be sure to look at the, the label, uh, read the labels thoroughly before you apply e either one of these materials. Imazepir has soil activity um, and therefore it means it can be taken up by the roots of neighboring plants including trees. And so we want to make sure that we don't have any off-target or unintentional um, damage to uh, desirable species. So make sure that you read these labels thoroughly and follow the, the instructions that are on, on those uh, chemical labels. Uh, this is a patch of Cahogan grass that has been controlled uh, by Amazapir. It does a very good job of uh, providing control of Cogan grass. One of the things, however, that you want to be sure that you keep in mind is that when, whenever we look at control studies for managing Kogan grass, we really don't determine how good it's going to be until we look at it 9 to 12 months later. Because Kogan grass, the leaves will turn brown, but it's the rhizomes that we're really after. We're really trying to beat down that below ground biomass to provide control. So even if you get very good top kill, uh, it's the long-term management that we're, that we're really looking at. The other thing that I'll mention is that we've seen very few treatments, I'd say less than 5%, where it's been a one-time only uh, application. We generally have to follow this up, uh, so it's a long-term management strategy where we have to go in anywhere from 12 to 24 months and continue to 
um, to spray or integrated management technique on Kogan grass um, over a two to three year period. Uh, it, because of the huge amount of rhizomes that are below ground, the plant has the ability to regenerate um, following a lot of above ground damage. So what we like to do is, is bring all of these methods together um, in an integrated approach or integrated uh, weed management. And here, the ideal scenario would be to burn uh, Kogan grass to remove the existing leaves, allow it to regrow, get it about uh, 18 to 24 inches tall. That way you have all nice fresh green leaves. Um, you can either employ a tillage operation or a herbicide op operation either in either order. Just make sure that if you till, you wait until you get about 18 to 24 inches of regrowth. If you spray, make sure you've got that much re regrowth uh, and then come in and till. So either one of those can, can go after the burning operation. Um, and the reason, like I mentioned before, the burning does a very good job is it removes that excess thatch. The other thing that it does is it stimulates regrowth, pulling reserves out of the rhizomes to build those, those new leaves. And that's why we wait until it gets about 24 inches because that's about the height that the leaves begin to return the favor and put uh, sugars back down to build more rhizomes. And that's where we want the herbicides to go because both glyphosate and mazepir move around within plant tissues. We want to make sure that they move in the right direction, and that would be below ground. So hopefully this has been uh, helpful in providing some uh, background about Kogan grass, background about how we tackle this species, uh, why it's a problem, and uh, why I think it's a good idea that we put efforts into managing um, this aggressive uh, invasive grass. Thank you.